Well, a warm welcome to today's talk and update, Tuesday the 28th of June. Now, today we're going to be looking at data from the UK that tells us that over 99% of secondary age children in the UK have antibodies for SARS coronavirus 2. And I really think the implications for reviewing the vaccine policy are there as a result of this data. We'll also be looking at increasing infections, largely driven by BA5 variant, but thankfully falling numbers of deaths at the moment. So this is the trend we've been hoping for or expected to see, increasing number of infections, which aren't necessarily that bad, although a minority are, but decreasing numbers of deaths. The proviso there is there's always a lag, of course, so we could still see deaths increasing a little bit, but nothing like what they have been in the previous peaks. And if time allows, I'll tell you what uh, you and I are most likely to die from. Now, um, um, we're looking at the leading causes of death. Now, this data is from the Office of National Statistics. Most school pupils in England had COVID-19 antibodies by March 2022. And this is a coalition of the great and the good. The Office for National Statistics, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and the UK Health Security Agency. Data released yesterday, and it's the results from round three of the school infection survey. And this is actually the third round that we're on of this survey now. Uh, Pretty comprehensive, well-conducted survey. Antibodies in secondary school-aged pupils, and this is from a sample of 884, but from a wide variety of schools across England, 99.3 had SARS coronavirus 2 antibodies virtually universal now these are people that reached the antibody threshold there would have been more that had antibodies that didn't reach the threshold so basically we can say that pretty well 100 percent of secondary school age children have either been vaccinated and or exposed to the virus let's go on um 64.9 percent were vaccinated and uh, 34 4.4% were unvaccinated. So we can see that at least 34.4% of those have natural uh, immunity. Uh, this is a very encouragingly large uh, number. Now, frustratingly, we're not told who had both. This is like, so what they've done is they've taken that figure there from the vaccines uh, or, or, or vaccines and or natural exposure plus the natural exposure without the vaccine, and they've given us that that total number. Now, frustrating that they don't break that down further. But even so, these kind of figures really suggest that we should be reviewing vaccination policy in this age group. The vaccination policies were introduced when there was basically an emergency. Um, At the moment, I don't think we're in an emergency situation. There's no precautions being taken, at least at government level. And I really think it's time that governments reviewed the vaccine strategy because of the changing risk benefit analysis in this age group. I would go further and say that if they don't review this, I think it's a failure of duty of care. I really think they need to get this uh, reviewed now because things have changed. Now, primary school children, similar sample number. Uh, Here we've got 82% had uh, SARS coronavirus 2 antibodies. And here, 0.04 were vaccinated. Uh, That means 81.6 were unvaccinated. So, again, that plus that equals that. But here we can see that virtually none of this immunity came from vaccination. So we can say that this is virtually all natural immunity. So really... Pretty, pretty compelling data, really, and really is time for a review of policies, I would have thought. This is the school infection survey. Just to tell you a little bit about it, uh, it's based on basically saliva. It's got a lower sensitivity than blood, of course, about 80%, but they do account for that using very clever statistical techniques. Now, uh, what the Office for National Statistics and these agencies are good at is statistics. They've got professional statisticians, of course, they're, they're, they're the best at this. But just frustrating that they, they don't give us the full breakdown on the types of immunity, whether it's natural immunity or vaccine-induced immunity, it's almost as if um, it's almost as if let's just say they haven't given us that information that I was aware of. Frustrating. Um, 
<clears throat> immunoglobulins and oral fluids at least a, a thousandth that of blood but, but they can still detect this with a high degree of accuracy and they can account for the inaccuracy in the ones that they're missing. Pupils were actually tested for, now this is what they say, pupils were tested for the uh, anti N antibodies from natural infection, the nucleoplasmid antibodies, and for the S antibodies from natural immunity and in vaccination, but they don't give us the breakdown of it, at least if they do, I can't see it. So uh, tantalising is there with this information, but um, not quite coming through. Bit, bit, bit frustrating. Now, increasing number of immunities is... Uh, um, in people testing positive is clear round one it was a uh, 40 and 82 um that was uh last year um round two again uh, 62 and 96 and now round three uh, 82 to 99.3 um so definitely uh, increasing in both uh, age groups quite significantly and uh, this data was actually collected uh, during um, during round three, coronavirus cases were increasing in England due to Omicron uh, BA1 variant times. Now, of course, since then we've had uh, BA2, uh, BA4, and now most, most notably BA5. So these numbers are going to be even higher. Really do feel it's time to review the, the, the policies. Um, haven't heard of any sort of anything in motion to do that but um, it just seems strange that the vaccination policies are not being reviewed in the light of this huge amount of immunity that's now being enjoyed uh, by this age group and of course we know nationally it's even higher than that it's 99 point probably about 99.3 99.4 percent but again that's only people that are above the antibody threshold so we know these are high so just a quick uh, quick look at the graphics so just a percentage of pupils testing positive by antibody status uh, so we see that um, this is vaccine and or natural immunity this is only natural immunity and the part that was due to natural immunity in the, the younger age group uh, 0.4 uh, percent uh, sorry the part that was due to vaccination in the younger age group 0.4 percent all of the rest all of this is due to natural uh, infection as we would expect as we become endemic. Uh, adjusted percentages for pupils testing positive. And again, you can see they're pretty sure on this by the low error bars. So the error bars here are really quite small. They're quite confident that this is uh, accurate data. Um, <clears throat> these, the, the, these are the adjusted percentages for pupils testing positive in round one, two, and three. So we can see the positivity rate or the testing positive go up in round one, two and three. And again, in the older uh, pupils in round one, two and three as well. And this actually breaks it down by age group rather than uh, school attendance. And again, we can see that the basically adult levels of high levels of antibodies over the age of uh, 12. And it really is past time that this should... Uh, this should change the risk benefit analysis, but we'll wait and see what becomes of that. Now, um, UK infections. Let's just look at, um, first of all, this is um, the ZOE data. Uh, and we see symptomatic infections increasing quite dramatically. Uh, and we've lost that picture for some reason. Never mind. <laughs> um, I wonder where that's gone. There we are, we're back again. So um, we can see it's gone up really quite dramatically, mostly due to BA4, BA5, mostly BA5. And we are getting uh, to the heights of the, well, we're not, we're, we're higher than the BA1 uh, original Omicron wave. We're not as high as the BA2 wave, but we are going up fairly, uh, fairly dramatically. So definitely increase in infections from there. And if we look at the overview from the Office for National Statistics again, uh, what do we see? Well, we see infections going up clearly. Hospital admissions increasing a little bit. Sorry about my technology problems today. Hospital infections going up a little bit. Um, deaths down a bit. Almost all adults had antibodies. ICU admissions remaining low. So there are some increase in hospitalizations due to the increase in infections, predominantly in the much uh, in the much 
older age groups. So UK infections here, this is the data we often look at, week ending the 18th of June. Um, Omicron variants BA4, BA5, but we know that BA5 is transmitting quicker than BA4, not necessarily because it's more transmissible, because it has more immune escape. It's more able to reinfect people than BA4, which was more able to reinfect people than BA2, than, than, than BA1. All of these are Omicron variants, probably equally transmissible if it wasn't for the pre-existing immunity and probably all causing relatively small amounts of severe illness and hospitalizations compared and deaths uh, compared to previous variants such as Delta, which was about the worst, although Alpha was pretty bad as well. Uh, so England current prevalence, one in 40. A lot of people, it's a lot of people, 1.36 million. Wales, one in 45. Northern Ireland, one in 30. Scotland highest at one in uh, 20. But deaths, um, sixth, leading cause, sixth leading cause of death now in England and Wales, 3.3% of deaths um, with COVID-19 on the death certificate. Of course, not all of these are actually due to COVID-19. Some of these will be coincidental. Um, deaths with rather than deaths from COVID. In April, it was the third leading cause of death now. Uh, when I read these, I thought, well, it would be interesting just to remind ourselves what the leading causes of deaths are. Now, I'm going to give you just a very brief rundown on this, just out of interest, really, from the UK and the United States. And I must say the US data is more uh, conveniently uh, broken down than the um, UK data. But this is in order. Now, dementia and Alzheimer's disease is giving us the, is the number one cause of death in the UK. Uh, but of course, this is much more likely to occur in the older age groups so to what extent is this saying that people died of dementia and alzheimer's disease or people had it when they died because um alzheimer's disease okay it's associated with a relatively short prognosis but the, thankfully the onset is fairly late on i mean dementia itself, itself is a progressive irreversible impairment of intellectual function and the, the degeneration of the brain doesn't necessarily cause death. It tends to be other things that go with it. So not that's the way it's the way the data presented. So that's what we've got. Ischemic heart disease. Ischemia means lack of blood supply to the myocardium. Disease of the coronary arteries is number two. Cerebrovascular disease is uh, the blood supply to the brain. Um, this can result in strokes, for example. The main cause is what we call thromboembolic where there's a blood clot in a blood vessel and the embolizes, bits of it can break off going towards the brain. Or it can be what we call a hemorrhagic stroke. These are less common, but that's where there's actually a burst in a blood vessel in the brain resulting in an intracranial hemorrhage, a hemorrhage into the brain in the within the cranial cavity itself. Chronic lower respiratory disease is number four. Uh, bronchitis, emphysema, chronic asthma. Then we come on to uh, cancer of the trachea, bronchus and lung. Now, quite a, these, uh, a lot of these are the hangover from the smoking, um, which has occurred over the last 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years even. Um, we don't actually see as many chronic lower respiratory diseases now as we do. A lot of the old smokers have already, uh, let's just say they're already no longer with us. But still, number four on the UK data, uh, six is influenza and pneumonia. Seven is uh, odds and odds and bods, ill-defined conditions. Colorectal cancer, eight, and uh, cancer of the lymphoid and hemopoietic. So this is like lymphoma and uh, hemophilia type cancers. Number nine, and at the moment, as we said, COVID would actually be, be, be in there. That would be actually uh, COVID at the moment. It's fallen down to number six. But of course, we know that many people with COVID have a lot of these comorbidities. Now, slightly more useful data from the United States. This is CDC data collected over the last 10 years. So um, basically, this is what we are most, you and I are most likely to die from. Heart disease, mostly ischemic heart disease in the States, the leading cause of death. This is where the coronary arteries get clogged up with this sort of fatty material. So if you have the artery there, um, it, gets, uh, it gets clogged up with this fatty atheroma material this atherosclerosis 
and that can lead to blood clots forming on the atheroma and that can block off the whole vessel. So the combination of the atheroma and the clot means that the area of tissue which is normally supplied with blood here is basically uh, it's got reduced blood supply or it's cut off from its blood supply and if that's part of the heart muscle that of course is a very uh, dangerous uh, situation. So that's clearly the leading cause of death in the United States. Then cancers account for 21.7%, a wide variety of cancers, of course, but still 217 And then way down after that, uh, unintentional accidents, 5.9%. Chronic lower respiratory disease, of course, as you would expect, is there from air pollution and smoking and other causes. Uh, stroke, which is cerebrovascular disease, is 5.18%. Alzheimer's, they've got as 4.23, which sounds more realistic to me. Diabetes, um, unfortunately, diabetes is increasing. We have a complete um, epidemic and indeed pandemic of diabetes. It's increasing still quite dramatically. Influenza and pneumonia. Kidney disease, mostly CKD, chronic kidney disease, chronic deterioration of the kidneys, suicide, appalling. 1.64% of deaths in the States are from suicide. A terrible statistic. Uh, septicemia caused by overwhelming bacterial infection and the body's reaction to that bacterial infection. 1.42% and chronic liver disease and cirrhosis, which is cirrhosis is scar tissue forming in the liver, 1.39% caused by alcohol and other things so overwhelmingly likely that you and I will be dying from uh, one of these uh, which of course is nice to know um, optimizing lifestyle factors of course can delay this process okay so so th there we are very high antibody rates um, in youth in the UK really time this was reflected in government guidelines for vaccination but I don't see any immediate uh, immediate change, unfortunately. Are the statistics similar in other parts of the world, Europe, Canada, United States? Yeah, they're probably, probably reasonably similar. Uh, we don't know that, but um, I would be surprised if they were significantly different. So there we go. Uh, Pandemic-wise, well heading into uh, endemicity as far as I can see. Uh, government guidelines still basically a lot of them orientated around uh, the previous emergency situations we've been in uh, time to come up to date I would have thought uh, but that's just my view and thank you for watching